Good morning, everyone. So let's see. Okay, I'm getting so sorry. Maybe I'll use the. Okay, that works. So I wanted to, since this is a patient Q and A, just start with a hundred percent true story. I wanted to tell you about my brother Dennis, who's a mechanic actually, and um, we speak often about how medicine is a whole lot like fixing cars and being a mechanic in terms of diagnostic, or you hear a weird noise, you figure out sort of what, what might be causing it. And one day he came to me with cramping pains in his lower abdomen and asked me if um, it could be his liver that's hurting. So I gave him a difficult time about not knowing where his liver is. I was like, you've lived in this body for 38 years. How do you not know? where your largest organ is. And he says, I'm gonna need you to go to that car at the curb that you put your life into and your child into every morning and show me how to change a spark plug. So I was like, touche. So I say this because this is a Q&A for all of us. Afterwards, you'll get a chance to speak to us. And I say it to say that if you've had IBD for 20 years, 30 years, or two years, you know, there are no silly questions. So I've had a lot of patients um, come into the visits and feel like they really have to know everything about the medications, everything about the disease process because they've had the disease for so long. So we all have our specialties. I can't change a spark plug. Dennis doesn't know where his liver is, but it's okay to ask any question and not feel like you have to really, you know, have a degree in IBD just because you've had this disease. So ask us, ask away when we do our Q&A session, please. So. No two Crohn's or colitis patients are alike. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start with a little bit of how we approach or how we look at the disease um, before we talk about new medications. But no matter the starting point uh, with each patient, the goal is always the same. And we want the tissue um, to go into remission. So all of the inflammation within the microscopic cells and tissues of the GI tract or wherever the disease may be active um, and the clinical symptoms to go into remission. So that means abdominal pain, bloating, um, any um, clinical symptom that the patient may perceive. Um, so when we talk about um, these features of, especially we all know sort of Crohn's um, itself can affect us anywhere, eyes, joints, skin, as well as the GI tract, and of course colitis can affect our liver and colon. Um, we look at each patient individually and say, okay, where is their disease active or what flavor of disease, so to speak, are we dealing with? And we stage the patient and say, okay, this is sort of, we borrow that word from cancer, um, from oncology and say, okay, wh what stage are we in and, and how active is this disease? And then every six months, if we change therapy, we restage um, the disease. So the features that the patient may have affect medication choice. So some patients may walk in and, um, and some of you, maybe those patients who go straight to a biologic or straight to multiple um, drug regimen and other patients can get away with a little bit of prednisone, a little bit of mesalamine or sort of a um, simpler regimen, so to speak. And so um, that depends in part on the manifestations on how sick the patient is. You know, where are you meeting? Are you meeting in in clinic because you've had a little bit of abdominal pain and bleeding, or are you meeting in the hospital ER because you're an extremist and you have a whole lot of symptoms and bleeding? And then, um, as I mentioned, staging can impact how we choose medications. And then your own history, you know, have you tried other medications that maybe have not worked for you? Do you have reproductive plans that might, may impact medication choice and, and your reproductive success? Um, and then what coexisting conditions you might be dealing with in terms of, you know, we all come as, as whole people, so in terms of coronary disease history or diabetes or whatever the case may be. And when we look at new medications or, or existing medications, we really um, have to remember where that medication is going. And this is a very complex or intentionally complex diagram of the inflammatory cascade uh, within our bodies. And so what the researchers do is they choose one protein or one aspect or spot in this inflammatory cascade and they target a medication towards it um, to kind of 
uh, clog up or stop the wheels from turning and, and forming more inflammation within the tissue. So any one of these um, names that you see of different proteins or different molecules can be a target for medication. So um, lots of opportunity for us to kind of interfere with the disease process and slow down the inflammation. And then briefly, um, in talking about new medications, I just wanted to review, I'm sure most of you are aware when we develop new medications, it's really a decades-long process from where the researcher might pick out, again, a protein or a molecule within that inflammatory cascade, develop that drug, and then do their research at the bench, kind of in tubes and petri dishes before it reaches the patient. And so when you're reading out there, about um, different medications, you can see generally what phase of testing they may be in. And so once it reaches human testing, you usually start with about 10, 12 patients, a very small cohort of patient volunteers that take this medication and we look primarily for, um, to look for safety of the medicine before we even ask, does it work for Crohn's or does it work for colitis? And each phase as you move through, phase two, phase three, and even phase four, um, the group of volunteers grows, and the question that you're asking is a little bit more broad. So not just, um, is this medication safe? Um, it's, you know, is it efficacious? Well, how does it compare against a placebo, you know, against a patient who may not be taking anything? And ultimately, how does it compare with existing medications on the market so that your doctors kind of know what to start with, what to move to. Um, and this diagram just sort of summarizes that same process. And every medication that gets approved is then also surveyed um, in kind of post-market. Once it's out on the market and we're all using it, um, if there is an event, for instance, a cancer that might, God forbid, happen to a patient or a heart attack, the company retains and the FDA retains that information and then is able to share it. And so sometimes you'll see emails come through or your doctors might approach you and say, look, in post-market surveillance, we discovered that there is this other effect that the medicine may have. And so let's talk about how to mitigate that, whether we change the drug or, or maybe do additional monitoring in your case. So the menu of medications um, that currently exist and are approved is listed there. So if that list looks long or complicated to you, that's a good thing. We have a lot of choices, sort of a lot of weapons. Um, but it sort of goes from the simplest on the top left down. Um, so if, like I said, if you have a patient with just a little bit of colitis, they may be able to get away with a little bit of prednisone and mesalamine. And then you may add an immunomodulator, which I know one of our panelists was mentioning. She was diagnosed in the 90s, and that may be all we had, and Remicade was just coming out. So you really you know, are kind of on the simple daily pill regimen on the top left. And as the disease maybe progresses, or again, that patient you may be meeting in the ER who more, has more severe disease or is sicker, uh, or perhaps has more extensive disease, um, that's involving their body, you may move down the list to the biologic medications and the small molecules. When we talk about the word biologic, I've had a lot of patients ask, again, in the spirit of the spark plug story, you know, we use this word all the time and we forget that some patients might not know what that means um, and it might seem like a silly question, but that basically just says these medications are made by living cells. So some medications you can cook up just like you cook a recipe, you know, at the bench and, and you get this molecule like aspirin, you put it into a pill and sell it. Uh, but some medications are so complex, the molecules are so large that there is really no machine or, or chemical reaction that we can put into a tube to create that. So we use the machinery of living cells. So they take um, sheets of living cells and, and under different conditions of temperature or, or um, nutri nutrients for that cell help it develop a, a medication that they then test and um, they call biologic medications. So that includes things like Remicade and Humira, um, Simzia, and, and you'll see a bunch of others there like Vitalizumab, uh, which is in Tivio, a lot probably similar or familiar names to you all. And then 
when it comes to new medications, if we go back to that um, inflammatory cascade, you would see that there is kind of a trend in what we're targeting. So most recently, a lot of companies are targeting small molecules, so you'll see that term. But that's um, interleukins, or IL, that's what that stands for, um, or sphingosine protein. So you'll see kind of different mechanisms or different classes of medications. And a class just means that, you know, it, it has the same protein that they're targeting. Um, so these are some of the new, newly approved medications for IBD, and a lot of them you'll see already in commercials for something like psoriasis or multiple sclerosis or other autoimmune conditions that then we use at maybe lower doses at, in, in many patients and find that it's efficacious for that autoimmune disease. And then we do go through those phases of testing that we talked about for IBD and make sure is it efficacious for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and on to, you know, is it safe, are there, uh, are there other side effects that perhaps were not evident for our rheumatoid patients or psoriasis patients. And there are also, beyond the ones that are approved, many that are in use in places like Europe and Japan that then the FDA uh, will take, bring into the U.S. and kind of go through all of the testing. Anything used in the U.S. has to have independent testing. So um, Europe and Japan could have used it for 30 years and thousands of patients. It's not good enough for the FDA until they've done their own phases of testing. So you can be assured that it's kind of double and triple checked, um, that it is efficacious and safe, and whatever information we need to have, we get um, in, and, and share with you in that conversation before starting any new medication. The other very um, common question that we get, especially lately with various insurances uh, mandating the use of biosimilars, is what are biosimilars? So same to, um, kind of similar to the question of what is a biologic, I've had patients kind of shy to ask what a biosimilar might be. Um, and so one of the main things that we want patients to know is that biosimilars are not generic drugs. And if you remember, a biologic medication is so large and complex that a living cell has to make it. So there's no machine that we could build to mimic what the living cell can do. So similarly, biosimilars um, are medications that perhaps a company has a patent on. The patent is expiring, so someone else may want to recreate that drug. Um, they take their own sheets of cells and their own various lab conditions and they focus on recreating that drug. So it may be slightly different in what the ultimate product is from their process, but the active component of that molecule does the same thing that the originator drug or, or the one that they're trying to copy. So then that developer goes to the FDA and says, hey, I think this is a biosimilar for Humira. And FDA does requires all of the testing just like they required for the originator drug Humira, for instance, to, to demonstrate that it is safe and that it is as efficacious as the originator drug that we're trying to copy. So even though the ultimate physical structure or chemical structure of the molecule is slightly different, the effect of it and the safety profile has to be the same as the originator drug. So they invented this word called biosimilar. So it's a biologic medication that is um, mimicking another one. And so if you hear, for instance, your provider saying you've been on Remicade or Infliximab and now you know, we, your insurance requires that we switch you to a biosimilar because it's cheaper for them because of how they might contract with various entities. Um, you are still receiving a medication that has been tested and proven to be just as efficacious as the brand name Remicade um, with the same safety profile and the same goals in terms of, you know, um, how effective it might be to bring you into remission or, or to heal your disease. Um, so. Because of this new process and a lot of patents expiring, um, a lot of healthcare systems and patients are seeing cost reduction with the move toward use of biosimilar medications. So certain insurances, um, like federal government insurances, for instance, may require that we use a biosimilar instead of the brand name medication for certain patients. So you might hear that term getting tossed around, but that's, that's what that one means. 
So it's not new drugs. It's the same class of drugs, same mechanism. And then when it comes to non-medical uh, or non-medication, I should say, new developments, um, there's a lot to be learned from going back to basics and talking about diet um, and the microbiome. And that's sort of the hot new area of research uh, for a lot of GI disorders. Um, nothing yet that was sort of prime time um, in clinical use or worthy enough of sharing today, but just know that that's one of the hot areas of research, so you'll see a lot more come out about um, how diet may um, kind of interact with our gut microbiome to then affect inflammatory uh, processes um, and the disease itself and the likelihood of flaring, for instance, or not flaring. Um, we do know that those diets that I've mentioned there can be effective for certain um, types of or, or phenotypes or sort of um, stages of inflammation in IBD. So for instance, if you have a stricture or narrowing in the small bowel, eating low roughage or low fiber diet may be helpful. Um, but some of the other stuff we really don't have a whole lot of data on yet, but that's kind of up and coming in a big area of research. And then when it comes to medical and surgical new frontiers or new developments, we are seeing um, more, or you, you'll kind of see more information come out on combinations of medications. So we're seeing patients who have lived and kind of grown up with biologics who then flare through all of these three, four, five different medications. And so then you say, well, what, what's next? And it, the answer for them may be combining biologics. So taking somebody on Remicade and adding Intivia or adding you know, a new agent that may be out there and seeing if perhaps attacking that inflammatory cascade with that complex chart that I showed from two different areas may be more helpful for that patient. So um, that's kind of one of the new, new areas of research as well. Um, and then, you know, certain medications may work best for folks after certain procedures or certain surgeries. Um, so for instance, a pouch patient might respond differently versus someone who has not had that type of procedure or surgery. Um, so that's sort of, in broad strokes, the overview of new drug development and some new names um, out there. And I'll be glad to take any questions after our sessions. Thank you.